shared data with the Chinese government. TikTok denies this and has encouraged its users in the U.S. to urge lawmakers to reject the legislation. The social media company's chief executive, Shou Zhu, says 300,000 American jobs are being put at risk. Our platform matters to the small business owners who rely on TikTok to make ends meet, to the teachers who inspire millions of students to learn, and to everyone who discovers and finds joy on TikTok. We will not stop fighting and advocating for you. We will continue to do all we can, including exercising our legal rights. Foreign governments could soon be banned from owning or having influence over newspapers in the UK. Rishi Sunak has proposed legislation which he says will help protect a free press. It follows criticism of a proposed takeover of the Daily Telegraph and the Spectator by a United Arab Emirates-funded investment firm. The Labour Party has said it will support them. Store closures among the UK's retail chains rose last year, with shops shuttering at a rate of 14 every day. Figures from the accountancy firm PwC and the local data company show that by the end of the year, there were 5,000 fewer stores although an increase in new openings, particularly food outlets, helped offset the losses. On the markets, in the city, the 100 share index ended the day up 24 points at 7,772. On Wall Street, the Dow Jones was up 38 points at 39,043. On the currency markets, the pound is trading at $1.27.9. Against the euro, sterling is at 1 euro 16.9. That makes the euro worth 85.5 pence. Now, sports in Bournemouth have achieved an historic victory in the Premier League. This and the rest of the action, here's Chris Coles. Bournemouth came from 3-0 down to beat Luton 4-3 in a remarkable Premier League game at the Vitality Stadium. It's the biggest comeback win in the top flight for more than 20 years and keeps Luton in the relegation zone. Atletico Madrid are through to the quarterfinals of the Champions League after knocking out Inter Milan on penalties. Borussia Dortmund are also into the last eight. They were 3-1 aggregate winners over PSV Eindhoven. In tennis, the world number two Arena Sabalenka fell to a surprise defeat to American Emma Navarro in the fourth round of Indian Wells. Iga Swiatek, Coco Goff and Caroline Wozniacki have all reached the quarterfinals. While in the men's draw, Yannick Sinner, Kasper Ruud, Tommy Paul and Daniel Medvedev are into the last eight. And Willie Mullins became the first trainer to reach 100 wins at the Cheltenham Festival after a hat-trick of victories on the second day of racing. Jasmine DeVoe's win in the champion bumper took Mullins to three figures. And finally, a look at some of the stories that were making the news on this date in earlier years. In 2022, a large civilian convoy finally left the besieged Ukrainian city of Mariupol after a number of aborted attempts set up by humanitarian corridors. In 2018, the, science, the scientist Stephen Hawking died at the age of 76. In 1939, the so-called timeless test match between South Africa and England in Durban had to be abandoned so the England cricket team didn't miss their boat home. The game which began on the 3rd of March is the longest test match on record. And in 1899, the former German general Ferdinand von Zeppelin received a US patent for his invention of a navigable bubble. Now it's time for prayer for the day with Reverend Kate Walton. Good morning. My God children are some of my very favourite people in the world. I'm single, I don't have children of my own, and I'm an only child, so I don't have biological nieces and nephews either. But there are quite a number of small, and they're not so small, people who call me Auntie Kate. And for four six and nineteen, I have the absolute honour of being their godmother. I like to tell their parents that this means that I'll always be both taller than they are and more fun. There's lots that I enjoy about my budget. I love hearing their stories of what's happened to them during the day. I love the little gifts they send me, the cards they get, the pictures they can send. I love how absolutely hilarious they are. But one of the things I like most is that they turn to me. They see me as someone who is absolutely on their side, who loves them and wants the best for them, and who has wisdom to offer them. I hope that will remain true throughout the whole of my life and theirs. I wonder where we look to for wisdom. Friends, family, colleagues, people within our community of faith. 
Yes, for me it's all of that. Ultimately, though, it's to the Bible I turn, again and again, day after day, for words of life and truth, for the answers to my biggest questions, and for the strength to keep going each day. Loving Lord Jesus, would you speak to me through your word? Guide me, help me, lead me, correct me, encourage me, I pray. Prayer for the day with Reverend Kate Walton. Now on Radio 4, it's time for Farming Today with Charlotte Smith. Good morning. Today, rural crime and calls for the police to overhaul their approach. Let's start, though, with how whiskey feeds fish. All week, we're looking into the many, often imaginative ways, byproducts and waste from agriculture are turned into something useful. Today, it's whiskey waste being used to make feed for salmon. Well, Scottish scientists have found a way to turn yeast into omega-3 using... ...oils produced this way could help save depleted feed fish stocks, boost Scotland's salmon farming industry, and give a clean, efficient way to dispose of the waste. Richard Baines reports from the Stirlingshire farm site where it's all happening. This is the starting point. So this is your two milliliter cell bank sample that comes from Edinburgh Labs. Barbara Fitzpatrick is a production technician at Mayalgi here at Clayland's farm near Balfour in Stirlingshire. That's grown for about 24, 36 hours. So this is a 10 litre inoculated bottle. The characteristic is that it grows exponentially from a small amount. We've just come from the lab where all the small scale stuff happens. Joe Partridge is the company's operations director. The team, they will take the 10 litre um, vessel and they will inoculate these thousand litre vessels. Once it's ready, the thousand litre material will be used to inoculate the 30,000 litre vessels here. It was that often problematic ability of algae to multiply which inspired company founder and managing director Douglas Martin to set up shop in 2017. Technical director Shrikan Ramanantham was one of his first hires. Douglas was working uh, offshore laying underground cables in the ocean. The whole uh, operation had to shut down because of uh, algal bloom. So this essentially led to him thinking how we could harness this potential. We got uh, funding from Scottish Enterprise to start the company, which is uh, initially just focusing on the uh, scaling up our area. The next clever bit was to choose to feed the algae on something that could otherwise go to waste. We take the co-products from distilleries, whiskey distilleries here in Scotland, and we use them, the nutrients within those waste streams, um, to grow uh, microalgae, which is jam-packed full of omega-3s. It looks like very cloudy beer. Yeah. yeah. It's sort of like you said, back it, automatically. Yeah. yeah. It's basically a yeast that's been boiled for hours before they produce the alcohol and that's what they're left with. The end product is a powder like fine brown sugar and that's what they'll sell to Scotland's salmon industry. Salmon is prized for its omega-3 oils, an important component of our diet. Currently the primary source of omega-3 is from wild-caught fish and that isn't sustainable. Those wild fish in fact get their omega-3 from eating algae in the sea. So the Scottish team say their product just cuts out the middleman, taking pressure off wild fish stocks. They plan to apply their technology at distilleries across Scotland and the rest of the world, and in the process, capture a big slice of the omega-3 market. The volumes of algae that aquaculture would need are huge. An estimate would be around 400,000 tonnes annually. So if we were to roll out our technology across Scotland into 10 distilleries and also move into maybe one distillery in America, one in Australia, we would probably be able to produce sufficient algae to meet 10% of the estimated demands. That's not where we would stop. We will continue to grow and grow the technology with the aim of being able to meet the full demands globally. The company is currently negotiating with major suppliers for its product to be used in salmon feed. 
Richard Baines reporting there. Now, night hawking sounds rather romantic, but for farmers, finding people metal detecting on their land without permission and at night, it's anything but. With threats and violence from criminals searching for valuable historic artifacts. Earlier this month, four men pled guilty to causing criminal damage and going equipped to steal after farmers found them night hawking on land in East Yorkshire in 2022 and called the police. One was jailed, two were fined and given suspended sentences, and a fourth was fined. Well, one of the farmers involved spoke to us, but wanted to remain anonymous. I went out with my thermal imaging as normal, just checking, um, found four people detecting about half past midnight, something like that. And then I contacted my brother, who got hold of the police. As soon as they came, we surrounded the area, the police tried to behind them, then they ran away. Obviously we found them with a the thermal and the police arrested them. It sounds relatively harmless, they're just metal detecting. Yes, but it's theft and they're all known to the police. They're not just metal detecting for a few coins or something like that. They're going equipped to steal, they're going onto heritage sites, they're going onto scheduled sites all over the country. So it has to be stopped. They're going out there to plunder these sites and then probably sell their fines onwards. They are known to the police, so you're looking at career criminals. So if they're involved with that, what else are they involved with? And over the years, have you met with trouble when you've tried to stop people? Yes, a neighbour of ours, he was hit over the head with a shovel, and they ran his brother over with a pickup. Both of them went to hospital. So as I say, we're not dealing with normal people. They're a nasty set. We need to stop them. But the main thing is, we've got backup. But when I ever go out, I always make sure other people know I'm there and we generally, maybe two of us or three of us go out. Over the past few years, the police say that they are taking this sort of thing more seriously. Have you noticed a difference? Yes, definitely. We've got the rural crime police now. They ring me up, they keep me in touch with them, what's going on in their area, I help them. So definitely, yes, far, far better now that we've got this rural police unit farmer from Yorkshire there. Well, his experience is not unique, as Mark Harrison, head of Heritage Crime at Historic England, explains. My job was actually created back in 2010, when Historic England was so concerned about the problem, they commissioned a report, and they actually called it the Night Walking Report. The problem was so severe that really they needed to bring it out, a policing advisor. So I was a chief inspector of Kent Police and an archaeologist, so they selected me to come in and develop what became known as the Heritage Crime Initiative. And our first problem was to tackle night walking. So what we're seeing is partly because it's showing that there's a reduction, but equally the level of enforcement has gone up. And do you think that's what has made the difference? Because we heard from a, a farmer in Yorkshire earlier saying this isn't just people out with metal detectors, this is career criminals getting involved here. Yeah, and I think that the vast majority of metal detectors are more money. But equally, there's a very small criminal minority that is intent on stealing from our past. These are objects and artifacts, they belong to all of us collectively. We're about to talk about the National Rural Crime Network's report, which talks about the involvement of organised gangs in rural crime. Do they get involved with things like Nighthawk? Well, certainly we've seen a level of organisation around the theft of metal for church buildings, and there's some evidence to show that is also the case around the theft of stone. Whether that applies to unlawful metal detecting, I think we need to do more research on that. What, in your view, makes the, the difference then to getting the numbers down? Well, when we started, I think there'd been one prosecution for night walking in history. If you look at the levels of prosecutions we've had since 2011, it's gone up year on year. I think there's been sort of three big things. Number one, was the sentencing council back in 2016 updating the sentencing guideline for theft. So if it did go night walking, they were convicted and get a hard sentence. Secondly, the training that we've done for police officers and the metal detective community as part of the Heritage Watch program, and giving landowners confidence that it's okay to call the police, say it's a heritage crime, and 
having Nightfall can dealt with as a crime rather than a civil trespass. Mark Harrison from Historic England. Well, as I mentioned there, the National Rural Crime Network is calling for an overhaul of the way rural crime is dealt with. It's commissioned a new report which says serious organised criminals are increasingly preying on rural communities. It highlights hair coursing, the theft of tractors and livestock, and fly tipping as having major impacts. <laughs> The report from Durham University says these crimes are often carried out by prolific rural offenders linked with illegal drugs rather than being opportunistic. Dr Kate Tudor is Associate Professor in Criminology at Durham and wrote the report. Rural crime is both serious and complex and involves organised crime groups in a number of ways. Up until now it's been quite difficult to evidence these links because of the way that we currently place organised crime. So in the UK, or England and Wales, we have what are called regional organised crime units, and they are involved in the kind of threat assessments for organised crime. Unfortunately, rural crime doesn't often meet the thresholds for involvement of refuse, and therefore, rural crime quite often fails to feature in organised crime did. So it's very difficult to understand the extent of organised criminality in rural areas. So is that simply then, because although the police will acknowledge it's a serious crime if livestock, for instance, or tractors are stolen, because there isn't that sense of threat, these regional police organisations won't look at it? Well, it's pretty complex, actually. It's perfectly understandable why this doesn't happen, because rural crime is competing with much higher hard offences, such as child sexual exploitation, terrorism, and so on and so forth. So you can understand how it doesn't meet the thresholds when compared with those offences. But what this research has recently shown is that actually we do have high levels of organised crime involvement in rural criminality. So we have rural crime groups that have been formally mapped by regional organised crime units. Generally speaking, they tend to be people involved in the theft of plant and agricultural machinery and vehicles. Generally speaking, when they relate to other high harm offences such as ATM ripouts using things like telehandlers, there are a huge number of groups operating as organised crime groups who just fall outside of local mapping procedures. So all of the criminality bears the hallmarks of organised crime. It's uh, cross-border in nature, it's involving groups, sometimes involving transnational networks, and they haven't been formally mapped according to these procedures, so they don't appear in organised crime data. Now in your report that you wrote for the National Rural Crime Network, you're calling for an overhaul of the way police deal with rural crime. But last year we did see the National Rural Crime Unit created. So is that not having an impact? It certainly is. So we've seen huge transformations in rural policing in the UK over the last couple of years. We see much better levels of coordination between forces. We see better intelligence sharing. We see better allocation of resources between forces. And this is something really to be welcomed. But the thing that we really need to be aware of is that this unit is actually externally funded. It's completely dependent on external donors. So I think the NPCC has a lot more that it needs to do to support rural policing. Are you confident that given the scale of the problem, that money will be forthcoming? Um, I very much hope it will be, because what I'm hoping that we've been able to do is to sketch out the high levels of harm associated with rural crime, but also the significant links to other forms of high harm offending, predominantly within the arena of drugs markets. So the research was able to show some really strong links between rural offenders and those involved in the supply and production of drugs. And so hopefully this will kind of underscore the importance of tackling rural crime because it, it currently forms a fundamental part of the criminal portfolios of serious and organised criminals. Dr. Kate Tudor there. That's it from us. I'm Charlotte Smith. The studio manager in Bristol is Caitlin Gaisley and the producer is Rebecca Rumer. The Today programme is next here on Radio 4, but first it's Tweet of the Day. And the ecologist Penny Anderson paused building work on her house when spotted flycatchers arrived. I first found spotted flycatchers nesting in my house when we were having restoration works done before moving in. I visited one day when the pointing was being sorted 
and out of the corner of my eye was this little brown flecked bird disappearing into a hole in the wall. I watched for a while, and sure enough, it was taking insects into the hole, presumably feeding young. Needless to say, I stopped the pointing so that the birds were not disturbed, and there have been spotted flycatchers breeding in the garden ever since. They are the last summer migrant to arrive, and I listen out for their quiet, peeping calls from mid-May. Their delightful habit of flitting out from a fairly leafless branch to catch an insect, and then returning to the same perch, makes them quite distinctive. And if you are wondering where they breed now, as an alternative to holes and house walls, I make best noises to detect them. But their favourite location is a kind of rose and a trellis sitting between two garage doors. And tomorrow's tweet comes from the black-throated diver, and that's here on BBC Radio 4. It's six o'clock on Thursday, the 14th of March. Good morning, this is Today with Amal Rajan in London and Justin Webb in Bristol. The headlines this morning, the government has published its new definition of extremism, saying it will help deal with the threat from Islamists and neo-Nazis. Michael Cohen will join us after 8 o'clock to tell us why. The Israeli military has said it plans to move Palestinians to humanitarian islands in central Gaza before any attack on the southern city of Rafa. Also in today's program, our Russia editor Steve Rosenberg is on the campaign trail ahead of this weekend's presidential election. The result? A foregone conclusion. No matter how you vote, everything is decided in advance. The number of centenarians in Britain will rise rapidly before 2050. How can society better support longer lives? And a new documentary follows a community's fight to reduce sewage in the River Avon. Oh, it's full of the river most days. Rain or snow. If I don't do this, I'm going to go nuts. Oh, I hate you. <laughs> but first this morning to the BBC News, read by Alan Smith. The government has set out a new definition of extremism, which will be used to assess whether groups should receive grants and support. Ministers say it tackles an increased threat to the UK from extremist groups since the Hamas attacks in Israel in October. But church leaders have warned the definition could vilify the wrong people. Labour called it tinkering. Here's our political correspondent, Damien Grammaticus. This new definition says a group can be deemed extremist if it promotes an ideology based on violence, hatred or intolerance, which aims to destroy the fundamental rights and freedoms of others or undermine the UK's system of democracy. <coughs> it's not a new legal standard, but the levelling up secretary Michael Gove will draft a list of extremist groups whose actions, while not illegal, are deemed threatening. The government says there will be a high bar. It will not silence those with private, peaceful beliefs, but will target Islamists and neo-Nazis. Some Conservative MPs are concerned it could have a chilling effect on free speech. The Archbishop of Canterbury has said the government should be seeking a broad consensus, not deciding on its own what constitutes extremism. The Israeli military says it plans to move displaced Palestinians in Gaza to what it's called humanitarian islands in the middle of the Strip, ahead of a planned ground offensive in the southern city of Rafa. More than a billion people are sheltering there, and there's been international concern that an attack could be a disaster. The American Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, said he wanted to ensure that civilians in Rafa were taken out of harm's way. Diane Abbott, who was Britain's first black woman MP, has accused both the Conservatives and Labour of failing to tackle racism in politics. Comments about her, which were reportedly made by a Tory donor, have caused a major row and have been widely condemned as racist. She has written an article for the Guardian newspaper this morning, as our political correspondent Helen Catt reports. 
After being spoken about for days, Ms Abbott is having her say. Her harshest words are for the Tories, whom she accuses of planning to ruthlessly play the race card at the coming general election. She points to the Rwanda scheme and to language about extremists to support her claim, saying it is a code word for Muslims. Asked to respond, a Tory source referenced a letter Miss Abbott wrote, appearing to suggest that Jewish people suffered prejudice rather than racism, for which she apologised and remains under investigation by Labour. Miss Abbott says in her article that it would be strange if Sir Keir Starmer threw her out of the party because of it. She also warns that Labour must step up to challenge racism. She says the party had failed to apologise to her for the content of WhatsApp messages previously sent about her by some Labour officials which were found in a report by Martin Ford Casey to have consciously or otherwise drawn on racist tropes. Labour did not respond to a request for comment. Researchers say the number of middle-aged people dying from cancer in the UK is at a 25-year low, but they warn that cases of the disease have risen sharply over the same period due to factors such as obesity. Here's Nikki Schiller. The study looked at cancer deaths in people aged 35 to 69. 2018, they dropped by more than a third, thanks to better treatments, more screening, and policies aimed at cutting smoking. But the researchers warned that improvements in survival rates are slowing down, and cases are rising, mainly down to increases in prostate and breast cancer. Four cancers, liver, melanoma, oral, and kidney. They're linked to known lifestyle factors like alcohol consumption, smoking, exposure to the sun, and being overweight or obese. <laughs> Chief executive of TikTok has warned that a potential ban on the app in the US would cost American businesses billions of dollars. The House of Representatives has passed a bill that could force the Chinese owners to sell up or be barred from America because of fears about data security. The board of the English Football League will meet today after top flight clubs failed to agree a new funding deal for those lower down the chain. The decision by Premier League sides to walk away from the agreement has sparked a backlash at Westminster and across the game. Here's our sports editor Dan Rowe. The EFL had hoped its board would today be discussing an offer from the Premier League to share significantly more money to help the game in England become more financially sustainable. Instead, it must decide how to respond after top flight clubs were too divided to reach agreement on a proposed £900 million funding deal over six years, despite being told by the government to redistribute more of their wealth. The Premier League says progress is now dependent on the adoption of new spending rules. But ministers have warned a proposed football regulator will impose a settlement if clubs fail to agree one. That was our sports editor, Dan Roan. Thank you. Six minutes past six is the time. Let us have our first go at the weather. It comes from Simon King at the uh, BBC Weather. So, morning, Simon. Hi, Justin. Good morning. It's going to feel really quite spring-like today for some of us, especially towards the southeast, where in southeast and eastern England there'll be some bright, some sunny spells through this morning. It might turn a little bit cloudier throughout the afternoon with the possibility of an odd shower later. Uh, quite breezy, but uh, with some sunny spells and with much milder air pushing in from the south, temperatures getting to 14 to 17 degrees Celsius, so that'll really feel uh, like spring. For southwest England, Wales and the Midlands, it's pretty cloudy to start the day, but we're missing some hill fog in northwest Wales and some showery rain in western areas, the odd shower across the Midlands. We're going to see a more organised area of showery rain moving its way into southwest England and moving north and eastward into the Midlands later this afternoon, quite breezy and temperatures of 12 to 14 degrees. For northwest and northeast England today, uh, rain affecting the far north of England this morning, uh, especially so the northwest of England. And uh, I think we'll continue with some rain at times in the northwest, but it will tend to clear off and uh, ease and uh, staying pretty cloudy for many into the afternoon but becoming largely dry uh, again quite uh, windy conditions for a time and temperatures of 12 to 15 celsius